Hello and welcome to this last week in August as we begin our worship with the announcements. Good morning. Please remember to keep uh, our special people in our prayers. Those names are listed in our bulletin. We also ask that you pray for the leaders and citizens of our country for the wisdom and understanding to continue to deal with the coronavirus, the civil unrest, and especially to all those who are concerned with our return to school. We ask a special prayer from all of you for the victims of Hurricane Laura. And again, every week as we want, our military service personnel and their loved ones need to be remembered in our prayer. Some of the updates this week for Zion, um, our worship ups update, uh, we continue with our service time at 9.30 in the morning, and that will continue until otherwise noti notified by uh, the powers that be here at Zion. Communion will be every Sunday, which is a wonderful thing. We do have masks available for anyone who needs one here in our parish or otherwise, and they're located in that big blue bin outside the handicap access door of the one side of the church. Last week, we're very proud to say that we had 93 of the 100 Lutheran World uh, book bags blessed here at our service last Sunday. A little update from our dartball team. Um, they will not be starting in October. Uh, there is plans to have another meeting mid-November to make the final plan of maybe when they're going to start their uh, games this year. If you have any announcements that you'd like to have, um, please be sure to call Marsha or you can get a hold of Pastor Frank and his numbers and their numbers are listed in uh, your bulletin. Thank you for the opportunity to kind of update you. And Pastor, I hand this over to you. Thank you. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sins. Reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust in your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have received grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example, point us to the path of obedience, and give us strength to follow your commands. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with God's word in the readings of our scriptures. First reading comes from Jeremiah, the 15th chapter. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and bring down retribution for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, do not take me away, 
Know that on your account I suffer insult. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and a delight of the heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of the merrymakers, nor did I rejoice under the weight of your hand I sat alone. For you have filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Truly, you are to me a deceitful brook like waters that fall. Therefore says the Lord, if you turn back, I will take you back, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall serve as my mouth. It is they who will turn on you, not you who will turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you, for I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hands of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. We continue with Psalm 26. I invite you to join me as we read it by verse. Give judgment to me, O Lord, for I have lived with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes. I have walked faithfully with you. I have not sat with the worthless, nor have I consorted with the deceitful. I have hated the company of evildoers. I will not sit down with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence, O Lord, that I may go in possession round your altar. Singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and recounting all of your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love the house in which you dwell, and the place where your glory abides. The second reading is found in Paul's letter to the Romans, the twelfth chapter. The introduction tells us that Paul presents benchmarks for a faithful relationship with Christians and non-Christians. Love is the unflagging standard of our behavior. When we encounter evil, we do not resort to its tactics, but seek to overcome it with good. While Christians cannot control the actions and attitudes of others, we seek to live at peace with all people. And now, the reading. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for that what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Our gospel is found in the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter. In our introduction reminds us that after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus reveals the ultimate purpose of his ministry. These words prove hard to accept, even for a disciple who Jesus called a rock. And now the reading. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you have set in your minds not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today's lesson is like the culmination of a two-part series, and it perfectly represents that link between belief and faith that we've been talking about all month long. In our story last week, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say I am? And most of the disciples try to ham and haw and avoid the question, figuring it was a trick. Well, uh, some say that you're uh, Elijah or uh, one of the prophets, yeah. Jesus won't have it. He wants to know, who do you say that I am? And finally, Peter, who has no, between, no filter between what he thinks and what he says, just blurts out, you are the, the Messiah the Son of the living God. Everybody takes a deep breath and steps back, and Jesus, instead of rebuking him, says, you got one right. My Father must have revealed this to you. And because of this, you will be the cornerstone of this body of people that will follow me, this body of Christ. Imagine Peter. I finally got a good one. Standing up. Hey, guys, I'm the new boss. Ha ha. Imagine the disciples, especially Thomas, who probably says, I don't believe he just did that. And Matthew going, eh, you don't believe anything. And so they wandered on. A little later, we see today's lesson. As Jesus tries to explain to his disciples what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And it incites Peter. This isn't the way things work. You can see him taking Jesus aside and saying, look, you're kind of new to this son of God business. You're only 30. You don't understand. Gods don't get hurt. People get hurt. Gods don't suffer and die. People do. I'm not going to have you getting into any of this stuff. Let's go back to Capernaum where you're safe and they love you. And Jesus has to tell him, you're being a st stumbling block to my ministry. This isn't what I want to do. This is what my Father has set me to do. This is the mission that I'm here to complete. He even says, get behind me, Satan. You're tempting me with doing what you think is important, with your goals in life. 
not with God's goals. Wow. I wish I could say what an interesting story. I wonder what it means. But the truth is, it tells us very plainly about our differences between belief and faith. Peter believed completely that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But he didn't have the faith to trust Jesus to perform his mission, to suffer and to die, and then to be resurrected. That just doesn't sound right. You can't do it. I won't permit it. All too often, we try to play God and tell God, you can't do that. I won't permit it. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. Indeed, thinking about these lessons, it made me think that there are three kinds of Christians in this world. On one extreme is the Christian who takes the words in Genesis where it says, God made us in his image, in his own image he made us and turns it around and actually makes God in his image. Yeah, this is the way my God works. This is, yeah, this is God for me. And oddly enough, for that person, God always seems to agree with what they're doing. God sees me as a good person, as a good Christian, and he's going to empower me to tell these people what God really wants from them. You betcha. This is the kind of person that will be very disappointed when things don't go his way. God, why don't you make these people listen to me? God, why don't you do the way I've told these people that we would? Why can't you perform the way I want you to perform? As you can see, this is all about him and not about God. <laughs> and it doesn't work well at all. And yet people are proud, and in their pride they tend to try to dominate God. At the other extreme is the person who believes in God, who trusts and has faith in God to lead and guide them. But that's where they stop. If God commands them to do things, they more or less ignore it. Yes, God, I believe in you, and I trust everything you tell me. Just not going to get around to getting it done, that's all. What a sad thing. It's a lot like this cartoon that Annie showed me. It's a picture of a guy on a porch bench, and he's sitting there talking to Jesus. And he says, Lord, I just don't understand. How do you... Let me live in a world full of hatred and anger, of, of homelessness and hunger, of, of disease and suffering. What's with this? And Jesus looks at him and smiles and says, a strange thing. I was going to ask you the same thing. It seems that God works through our hands. And so when you ask God, why does these things happen? The answer is, why haven't you done something about it? Oh, that's a tough one. The third kind of Christian is the one that hears the word of God, believes it is God, and when God speaks to him, allows God to guide him and inspire him and command him to work. This is the person, in his efforts to serve God, that goes into the community and tries to care for his neighbors, tries to build up the place where he lives into a better place. This is the one that I think we can call the cornerstone. This is the one whom others can build their faith upon. This is the one 
who in his caring for his neighbors causes the neighbors perhaps, we hope, to say, yeah, I like the way he does things. I want to be like him. I want to have a relationship with God like he has. And so Christ's body of church, body of Christ, builds and grows through his efforts. Compare that back now to the one who, I hear the word of God, I believe it, I just am not going to do anything. That poor fellow can never be a cornerstone. That person is just a brick in the road. Eventually he's hoping that someone will pick him up and build him into this church, but he's not much involved in doing anything on his own. Compare that to the one that builds God in his own image. He's a cornerstone, all right, but he's a cornerstone to his own body, not Christ. And as such, he becomes really a stumbling block in our efforts to find Christ. It makes us wonder, which one am I? And how can I be better at being the true cornerstone of Christ? Do you notice in most of these things we're helping those who suffer, we try not to get involved in doing things, we try to get things to be done our way and not God's. A lot of that involves suffering. And suffering is a primary test here of faithfulness. It is through our response to God during times of suffering that we show our true nature and our true relationship with God. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah goes to God and says, Hey, you called me, you gave me your commands, you sent me to these people, and life has been miserable ever since. I don't think they like me. They pick on me. When are you going to step in and help? He's had a rough life. God's answer to him in that lesson is, I am with you. And these people will beat against you, but they'll never succeed. And why is life so hard? Well, I'm sorry, but you can't win a battle if you don't get into the battle. You have to live in a broken world to fix it. You can't stand on the outside and not be involved and still expect to have an impact on the people around you. We have to be a part of this world to make it better. In times of suffering and difficulty, though, each of the type of Christians I talked about respond in different ways. The one who builds God in his own image, who sees himself as the really good Christian, has a problem. First of all, he doesn't see the world as it really is. He rarely sees the world as it ought to be. Instead, what he sees is the world as he would want it to be. And so when things go bad, he's disappointed badly. He's hurt. And who does he blame? God, of course. I'm doing everything for you that I can, God. Why don't you listen to me? And God, in his wisdom, simply sits back, and the fellow never hears him say, I think you're supposed to listen to me. To the person who believes in God, listens to God, but doesn't want to be involved in anything, when disaster comes, he usually curls up in a ball, sticks his thumb, his thumb in his mouth, and just kind of hugs himself and waits till it all passes. And if he suffers greatly in the time it's there, he finds himself saying, well, it must be the will of God. Never once guessing that maybe I could have fixed this myself. Maybe God could have helped me to stave off some of the suffering. The one who is the cornerstone, who hears the word of God, listens to his commands, 
looks at the problem and actually tries to do something according to God's commandments. He's the one that will have a role in stopping and saving us from all the suffering. And for him, we have the tools that Paul lays out in his letters. I tell you, right now, Annie should be playing the music to Mission Impossible because the first two steps are pretty darn hard. The first one is to love your enemies. I'm working on it. Respond with good for evil. I'm thinking about it. Not to take vengeance. Mm, yeah, I think I can do that. But they're rough. This is the true test of a Christian. And then for the ones where anger and animosity aren't involved, to care for those in need. To love the ones around you. To help them. Yeah. That's the mission. Paul tells us that love and care, the love of our neighbors, is the key to our relationship with God. It is the key element that makes us a Christian. It is the true and ultimate test of our faith to God, of our trust in God. God sends us forth into a hostile world, not to conquer but to show love. Tough job. So this week, this is what I'd like you to do. I want you to sit back and think of your relationship with God and look at the world around you and say, what in my little neighborhood needs my attention? And I want you to think about what can I do that will be both helpful to them and pleasing to God? And I want you to go to God in prayer and say, lead and guide me, Lord, to go out there and do what needs to be done. Do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the, On the third, third day, day he rose again, he ascended, he ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll begin now with the prayers of intercession. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of faithfulness, you bid your people to follow Jesus. Set the mind of your church on divine things. Grant us trust in you that we lose our lives for the sake of Christ and thereby discover joy in life through him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth is yours and all that is in it. Heal your creation and give us eyes to see the world as you do. As the seasons change, pattern the rhythm of our lives in harmony with all creation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless and protect the caregivers and guardians of our world, the emergency workers, nurses, doctors, and therapists. Bless and protect the soldiers, police, and firefighters as well. May your love and compassion comfort and sustain them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of salvation, 
you promise to deliver us. Give those who suffer a strong sense of your presence and love. Accompany those who are uncertain. Raise the spirits of those who are despairing. And heal the sick. Today we ask that you be with Mike and Tony, Morgan, Merlin, Belinda, and Steve as they struggle with their illnesses. Lord, in your mercy. Please hear our prayer. God of community, you call us to rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, and persevere in prayer. Make our congregation a workshop of your love. When we quarrel, bring reconciliation. When we serve others faithfully, bless us. Help us to always strive to overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of all grace, you give us everlasting life. In love, we recall your holy ones who now live in your undying light. In our remembering, give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Lord, in your mercy. Please hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll begin now with an offering prayer in the introduction. We give special thanks to all those who contribute to support this ministry with their gifts and their offerings. We recognize their special ability and their love for one another. Thank you, Lord, for these people. Let us pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. Now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Now Amen. and forever. So be safe. Love one another and enjoy the blessings that God's bring into your life. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.